today on Point of the Spear. There's so much written about, you know, the 8th Air Force and the bomber crews, but the, you know, the troop carrier men, you know, who wore this patch, you know, right. the airborne troop carrier patch and the glider pilots, you know, who dropped the paratroopers and flew aeromedically back in combat resupply missions. Most people, don't, there's not much written about them. So I felt I needed to fill this void in history. Retired Air Force Colonel and author Mark Vlahos is here to talk about troop carrier operations in World War II. And we'll hear from him right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. Today's guest spent 29 years in the Air Force. His freelance writing career began in 1994, when he was a major stationed at the Pentagon. He published his first two articles in the Washington Times Saturday Civil War page. In 2015, he published his first book, Winfield Scott's Vision for the Army. His current book is called Men Will Come, a history of the 314th Troop Carrier Group, 1942 to 1945. And retired Air Force Colonel Mark Vlahos joins us now. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Rob, thanks for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity. You're very welcome, and we're honored. And I understand we have a mutual interest in World War II gliders. Yes, we sure do. Uh, obviously, being an airborne troop carry historian, the glider operations comes with that piece, and uh, I'm excited to, to talk about it today. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into it a little bit later. Before we talk about the book, I'd like to hear more about your Air Force career, and I understand you were a, a master navigator on C-130s. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's correct, Rob. Uh, for me, military service was a calling. Uh, my father entered the uh, Merchant Marine Academy in 1944 during World War II, and and this was just two years after his father, my grandfather, survived a Nazi torpedoing on a merchant ship. So uh, military service is in my family. I, I was commissioned in 1982 mm. through ROTC uh, at Virginia Tech and ended up serving 29 years. And uh, I was just blessed to be part of something far bigger than myself, uh, serve with great people, uh, the opportunities you know, this ordinary guy got to do extraordinary things because of the Air Force and in both C-130 ops and a special duty assignment flying presidential flight support on 707s uh, with the presidential 89th Air Force Wing. So I had a fantastic career. Thank you. What was uh, what was involved with the presidential flight support? What was really neat about that, the, the navigator, you know, had, had a fantastic mission because uh, just all the, the mission planning and... Uh, I was able to fly uh, from Air Force Two down, per se. I wasn't in the Air Force One. I didn't fly Air Force One, but I flew Air, Air Force Two, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, shuttle diplomacy missions, you know, around the world. So, and uh, I was in that assignment from 1989 to 1994. You have to remember when the wall came down and the USSR collapsed. So right. I got to go on some great trips into Moscow and other places in the. In the in Russia, when when the USSR collapsed, you know, some it was just amazing times. Now the book on the 314th in World War II hits close to home because I understand you were a vice wing commander in the very same unit. Yeah, that, that's true. I, actually, Rob, uh, during my career, I actually had three tours in three different decades with the 314th, which is at Little Rock Air Force Base today, and. Uh, I actually flew with three of the original four squadrons that, you know, World War II squadrons in that in that group as well. And uh, so the, the 314th has a fantastic history since its activation uh, during World War II. And uh, my last assignment there, uh, 2007 to 2009, I did get to serve as the vice wing commander, which was just an honor. And uh, so writing this unit's history, you're right, was very personal for me. And uh, it was just a neat calling uh, thing to do. Now, you've probably met a lot of the World War II veterans from the 314th in, in the writing of the book. Do any of the veterans yeah. or any of their stories stand out to you? Yeah, Rob, uh, i just tell you the, uh, the group commander, Colonel Clayton Stiles, uh, who I got to know his two sons very closely in researching and writing this book. They're now my best friends, obviously, and so are their grandkids. Mm. But... Uh, Clayton's son, Howard, who's 85 years old now, by the way, retired colonel himself, uh, told me the story about uh, the first mission of the war, combat mission. Clayton Stiles was leading 60 aircraft. Uh, this was during the invasion of Sicily. Uh, they were carrying paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne on board. 
And right after they made the drop, just inland in Sicily, around the town of Gala, on escape from the DZ, Clayton's aircraft was shot down by a, a German pillbox, as the, and both engines quit at the same time. Uh, Clayton was able to uh, ditch the aircraft. Basically, he landed it, you know, on the wave tops with both engines out, glided it, landed it. The uh, the aircraft floated for about 15 minutes, and the, the crew was able to get out into the dinghies, into the life rafts. Uh, but what Howard told me, and this was amazing, you know, and this is in my book, Men Will Come. As calm as a cucumber, Clayton Styles was about to step into the life raft when he realized that he left his pipe and his tobacco back up in the cockpit. <laughs> so the, the plane's sinking, the, uh, you know, the water's up to his ankles. He walks back all the way through the cargo compartment, back into the cockpit, grabs his beloved pipe and tobacco that he had stuffed up, up there in the right corner, left corner by the pilot's uh, window, and yeah. comes back and literally the aircraft is about to sink and the crew chief is just, you know, horrified that, you know, <laughs> come on, sir, we need to, to get going. And finally, Clayton gets on the raft and, you know, just as, you know, the tail goes up in the air and, you know, it, it dips under the waves. But uh, just just a really neat story. And what's amazing is the crew chief who was on that aircraft, sadly, just passed away this year, just a oh, month shy God. of his 105th birthday. I mean, wow. really amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and there's actually a, a two hour interview with him on YouTube. You can look up his name oh, is Leo regard uh I'm, I'm friends with both uh, with his family members also so that story you know told by his family and clayton's family we i was able to piece together the story of the ditching on the, the first combat mission of the war uh, there's so much written about you know the eighth air force and the bomber crews but the you know the troop carrier men you know who wore this patch you know right. the airborne troop carrier patch and the glider pilots you know who dropped the paratroopers and flew aeromedically back in combat resupply missions most people don't, there's not much written about them. So I felt I needed to fill this void in history at the same time, helping, you know, preserve stories for the families I met, you know, telling the stories of their relatives and, you know, I do it for them. So it's just been a great, great journey. I can imagine. Yeah. I saw that in, in the description of the book that you did, you wrote it for the families and the veterans. Let, let's get back to the, uh, I mentioned uh, the World War II gliders and, sure. and, Tell us your involvement with the World War II Glider Pilots Association. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, you know, there's many people in America don't realize we had flew gliders and had glider pilots in, in World War II. And the, the glider pilots were embedded in the C-47 squadrons, the troop carrier squadrons. So obviously, if you're going to be a troop carrier historian, you need to understand glider ops. So I actually got a neat, this is a story in itself right here, how when I was researching and writing Men Will Come, it quickly became apparent to me that my knowledge of glider operations needed to increase to, to be credible to write that book. So I contact, I started doing some requests for information with the National World War II Glider Pilots uh, Association, now called Committee. And uh, I met their, uh, their leader, Patricia Overman. And af after so many requests for information, she just said, Mark, why don't you just join us, do volunteer work for us, then you can have access to our database, you know, and then you won't be eating up all my time. So it was, it was just a, and then I, I quickly realized it's, it's an outstanding organization that, that was actually uh, formed by the glider pilot veterans themselves. So that's a neat story. It continues on, but, but what I do for them, uh, I do free research for families. Uh, sons and daughters, grand grandkids of glider pilot veterans. We research what their what their relative did in the war. We have a database online of every glider pilot, and about six thousand of them. I wow. uh, do entry into the database, you know, because we use primary research resource material for all our research. So it's got to be documented. If you're going to say somebody did something, you have to have a document to back it up. So we fill in their records, uh, so the family members know what they did. And uh, I'm actually a member of the Leon B. Spencer research team, which is a, a group of about uh, about 15 very well-educated folks. And we have some in Europe also members who are real educated on glider operations. So we pull our resources to help the families and, and populate this database. Uh, so that's that's my volunteer work. Um, mm -hmm. I've written articles for their, uh, their publication called The Briefing. It's fantastic. Uh, you need to look at it sometime. I will. Uh, my, my last story I written actually was called Untold Troop Carrier Stories. 
from the secret war in the Balkans. And this was actually a teaser for the, my next book, which we're going to talk about in a little bit also. So right. Right. It, it's offered a, a lot of a platform for me to, to give presentations, author stories and do volunteer research. My background for the listeners, if, if they don't know the story is I did this, the film, which you've seen now, Silent Wings, uh, the World War II glider pilots. And uh, I worked closely with Michael Samick, who yes. was a World War II veteran or glider pilot. The film became the catalyst to push Congress towards a joint House resolution to honor the, the glider pilots. So mm. back in 2007, Carolyn McCarthy and the Arms uh, Services Committee pushed through a bipartisan resolution, joint resolution, that honored the World War II glider pilots for their service 65 years after the war. And Michael Samick was able, and myself, uh, were able to go down and actually see the vote in Congress, sit in the a special member section, and, wow. and watch the vote, the historic vote to honor the glider pilots. So I have very fond memories of... Uh, of working with Michael and working with other veterans of, of World War II, the World War II glider pilots. And I also spent some time down at the museum in Lubbock. Yeah. yeah have you visited that museum? Uh, I, I have. It's, I was going to, I was going to put in a plug for that, but uh, oh, you just ahead. did. A, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great, the, uh, the glider pilot, uh, absolutely organization, World War II organization coupled with that museum, uh, it's there to educate the public. And for anybody visiting Lubbock, Texas, it's a must to see. Uh, great, uh, great product they have there. The museum is located on the original uh, Southwest Plains Army Airfield, where they, that was the major gliding glider pilot training facility during World War II, right there on that field. So, Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's, that's so amazing. it's the perfect location to have that museum. Yeah, Lubbock. I remember flying into Lubbock. It's, it's like this just all flat. It's just brown and flat. <laughs> so perfect place for gliders. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to Texas. Yeah. I live in New Brunfels, Texas, about, about six hours from there. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next time, I guess we'll be author Robert Sutton discussing the secret Nazi POW intelligence operation based just outside Washington, D.C. that helped win World War II. By the end of the war, because of this elaborate and really pretty amazing intelligence program. They said Eisenhower probably knew more about the German military operations than Hitler did. That's next time. Thanks for listening to the program. I hope you'll support our guests by clicking on the book purchase link in this episode's description. Each purchase helps support local bookstores, and that's always a good thing. It's such a great story. I hope uh, our listeners look up more on the on the World War II glider pilots. But switching topics, you grew up in Virginia. You said Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, and you spent 30 years actually Civil War reenacting and uh, participated yeah, in that's... the Gettysburg movie. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's just kind of a, a neat hobby. Like I got interested in military history and colonial history, and you know, Virginia is just full of Civil War history. Just growing up in Richmond, I was around the mecca of a lot of neat history. So. And uh, but uh, got into Civil War reenacting during high school, actually. And then uh, throughout my Air Force career, when I could, you know, be involved with the hobby, I continued it on. And I still do to this day a little bit also do volunteer work at historical sites. But uh, yeah, it was 1991 when uh, Gettysburg was filmed. Uh, I was actually a, a captain in the Air Force at the time, stationed mm. at Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, with the Presidential Flight Support Wing. Uh, my goal was to be in the uh, Pickett's Charge in the Little Round Top scene, but uh, I, I could only get enough leave to be in one of those, you know, because you know they, the military's got to approve your leave. But I, I was able to make it into the Pickett's Charge scene. Oh, great! And that was an amazing experience because if people, anybody who's been around filmmaking like yourself, uh, large scenes like that are filmed in stages, you know, then they're put together later, editing, splicing. They just take raw footage. So ended up being. In the Pickett's Charge scene, I'm both a Confederate uh, soldier and a Union folk, uh, corporal fighting, you know, each other, you know, in the same scene, you know, once it was all put together. So kind so of a real neat experience. Were you able to pick yourself out in the battle? I I could because when they when they first started shooting the scene, I, I remember this vividly. They had a little chopper camera. They had a little helicopter with a camera on it. 
and uh, flying through the air. And they needed 5,000 guys for this one scene, you know, when the mm -hmm. Confederates first start coming out of the, the woods, approaching the assault through the artillery positions. And uh, I'm just marching in the ranks there. And I kind of knew where I was in the center of the formation. But then as it gets closer to the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, when they reach the Union lines, I'm right there, a Union corporal, right at the apex of the charge. So I was able to find myself uh, right at Cushing's Battery, which was the apex of the charge. Well, that's amazing. And you spent 30 years reenacting, you said. Yeah, I've actually been out this year once. Uh, COVID kind of put a little damper on that hobby for the last couple of years. But uh, a lot of it's living history, you know, at, at uh, historical sites. It's right. just educating the public. It's not just, you know, doing battle reenactments. Most of it's actually more of a, an educational aspect, which I enjoy. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time around Civil War reenactments, and I did the 150th Gettysburg, and I've been in uniform myself during some of the battles. I, I was at the 150th Gettysburg as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we filmed that whole uh, massive event. Well, what's amazing is the 130th, 20 years before, had 25,000 participants. So you're talking about massive was, yeah, that in, but, yeah, amazing I, in the 1990s. That was before I started doing it. I, my first filmed reenactment that I produced was in 2003. It was the 140th. And then I was involved uh, with other fil uh, Civil War projects. But I have to tell people that those uniforms are not <laughs> cool. <laughs> Wearing the wool in 90 degree weather and humidity is quite a, quite a chore. <laughs> quite an experience yeah. to behold. I remember, you know, speaking with the reenactors because I dealt a lot with the reenactors in the filming. One of them joked with me and he said, there's one rule that we live by, die in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I said, that's a good rule to live by. Indeed. Some great people in that hobby, definitely. Yeah. Um, it's, Lifelong uh, friends. Yeah, absolutely. I, I still stay in touch with people in, in Gettysburg. And that's, you know, the last time I did that production was uh, seven, eight years ago. You have a new book coming out. Is it coming out next year? Tell us about that one. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about, about this one, Rob, because I, I literally, the contract has just been worked, you know, in the, in the last week or so. And mm. uh, my uh, manuscript submission date is 15 December. So you can see I'm at the, the, the stages of this product uh, project. But uh, this is another troop carrier group history. It's on the 60th Troop Carrier Group, and uh, the book will be entitled uh, Leading the Way to Victory, the History of the 60th Troop Carrier Group, 1940 to 1945. And what's amazing about this story is the 60th was actually the first C-47 group to deploy overseas just six months after Pearl Harbor. And uh, the group, you know, the, the title's perfect because Leading the Way to Victory, uh, the invasion of North Africa was our first major uh, offensive in World War II. The U.S. took part in, and mm. they spearheaded. There's this actually flew the first combat paratroop drop in U.S. Army history during the invasion of North Africa. What year was that? Uh, 1942, mm. actually, in uh, Operation Torch. Right. And uh, once we uh, the troop uh, then departed England, flew the mission over Spain, airdropped the paratroopers and just south of the, city, the port of Iran there in uh, North Africa. Then the troop obviously stayed there in North Africa. And as we went across North Africa, next came the invasion of Sicily. And the 60th Troop Carrier Group flew the first glider tow, combat glider tow mission in U.S. Army history there as part of the invasion of Sicily. And this is where I'm really excited because for the first time I was able to put together, this has never been published, a complete... Uh, formation with all the names, aircraft tail numbers, uh, crew members' names, glider pilots' names for the entire formation. Wow. And uh, so real excited. And, and it was actually, they were British. it was a British glider mission, USC 47 towing British glider crews. And it was, it, a lot of things went wrong, you know, and, and a lot of lessons were learned in blood. Right. And, uh, but these, the good news is we studied these lessons and the, the big airborne operations, you know, in France and during World War in, in 1944, two, two years later, you know, were, be, were successful because of the lessons learned in Sicily and blood. There were a lot of lessons learned in blood. I remember from doing Silent Wings, wasn't there a friendly fire incident uh, with a C-47? Oh, you're, you're exactly right. 
that was on the, uh, in fact, that's mentioned in my 314th book. The 314th was one, of, unfortunately, one of the units that took the brunt of that. That was on a returning from a paratroop drop on, on night two, uh, just flying over the Allied fleet. After they made the drop in Sicily, they were returning back to North Africa when they flew over the U.S. Navy. But unfortunately, there was a, a German formation had attacked those Navy ships just 30 minutes prior to the U.S. C-47s flying back over, and the, the gunners were jittery, and uh, sadly, 23 C-47s were shot down by the by the U.S. Navy. Uh, there were hundreds, over 300 paratroopers' lives uh, and crew members' lives, paratroopers who didn't jump, and other people who were injured. And but you know, again, it was a lesson learned in, in joint operations, coordination, and things like that that need to be done ahead of time. Yeah, that was a disaster. And yeah, yes, it was. Didn't that contribute to the planes being painted in Normandy? In the Normandy? You're, you're exactly right. The, in, the invasion stripes uh, to help uh, with friendly fire entrance incidences. But what was amazing is after that disaster in Sicily, uh, the government and the military, obviously, they, they kept that disaster from the public for a year, you know, for morale oh, really? reasons, you know, because uh, it's just not a good story. No. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that in the... Uh, the things that went wrong on the British glider mission, you know, a lot of the gliders went down in the sea, were, were dropped too far offshore for a lot of reasons. And it was just so, but, the, but all that was kept, you know, out of the public eye because, you know, we had to keep uh, relations good with, you know, obviously the British and continue on the war effort. And uh, it was necessary to do those things. Yeah. It, you mentioned that dropped in the sea. Michael Samick was one of the glider pilots that actually Got dropped yes, he was. There were 26 American glider pilots who volunteered and flew that British mission, and uh, two missions actually. And uh, I'll just give you a peek under the tent. Sure. Um, my my book after this one on the 60th, I'm gonna Patricia and I want to co-author, and it'll be about those 26 American glider pilots in Sicily. So, oh, that's great. That's that's a couple years down the road, but it, we're just uh, starting to talk about that project. Excellent. That is, that's great. Well, the book we're talking about now is your current book, your last book. It's called The Men Will Come, A History of the 314th Troop Carrier Group, 1942 to 1945. Yeah, it was a, this was a, a three-year labor of love. It, it's huge. It's 508 pages, over 330 maps and illustrations and photographs, I many from family members, I love some it. dug out of attics. And... Uh, <laughs> It was just a lot of firsthand accounts, and uh, this was just a, a really uh, just a great project, a, a great story to tell. Well, I encourage everyone to go out and purchase it at their first opportunity. Mark, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, Rob, I, I really appreciate this opportunity, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Absolutely. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, I guess will be author Robert Sutton discussing the secret Nazi POW intelligence operation based just outside Washington, D.C. that helped win World War II. By the end of the war, because of this elaborate and really pretty amazing intelligence program, they said Eisenhower probably knew more about the German military operations than Hitler did. That's next time. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter, at Rob Child, where you can share your comments about the show. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener supporter members. You make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join, and it takes just seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page, click the support button, complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So don't wait. Become a member today, and thank you for your support.